Let's turn our attention now to this morning's papers with my guest, Cornelia Mayer, who is an international economist and media commentator, Melanie Uzbe, who is a business expert and media watcher. Guys, thanks for coming in. Let's um, turn to the Wall Street Journal Asia, which has this story that we've been actually talking about today, Turkish forces enter Syria. This is a um, Turkish uh, army going in to uh, evacuate um, some of the military uh, that is there outside an Ottoman tomb, and the Syrian regime have responded angrily, calling it an act of flagrant aggression. Is that what you'd, um, you'd describe it as? No, absolutely not. Because you look at it, it is, it is this territory which is actually belongs to Turkey because the French bequeathed it to Turkey because Suleiman Shah um, is the national hero, is um, the Ottoman hero, is, is, is buried there. So they, they, these, these soldiers who were guiding the tomb were in crossfire. And so they evacuated the, the remains of Suleiman Shah and the soldiers. They came in with 100 people, moved out. Turkey has been at great pains not to get involved. And this one, they notified the embassy in, um, in, 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 um, in, in uh, uh, Ankara, the Syrian embassy, and said, we're going to do this, didn't wait for permission, and then went out. So it is not flagrant at all. They were just protecting their own getting out. And if there's one thing that Syria has always been given flack for by the coalition against ISIS is that they're not getting more involved, that they're not putting ground troops in, that they're not, not willing to, to participate. But this, understandably, the Turks say, look, <laughs> we have... Iraq next door, Iran next door, Russia next door, and Syria next door. We live in a pretty tough neighborhood. We don't want to get involved. And Melanie, the, the reason they did this was because there had been made threats against this tomb by Islamic State in the past. And I think they'd waited a year, or at least they'd been guarding it for around about a year. So you could say, fair enough, you know, they, they haven't killed anyone while they've been doing it. They've exactly. kind of done it. But, um, Again, they, you know, it, it, yes, it is their kind of sovereign territory, but only that particular bit, isn't it? They still have to go through Syria. So could they have been a bit more diplomatic about it? I don't think they could have been any more diplomatic under the circumstances. I think that they have been extremely diplomatic, considering their geopolitical location. And with giving notification, not asking for consent, very clear, but giving notification that they are going to get go in and... You know, these aren't just kind of these random remains. These aren't just, you know, random bodies. This is, you know, the grandfather of the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And so to elongate the, the discussion over a year, to go in and ask for permit or to ask not for permission, but go in and tell them this is what's happening. No shots were fired. Very clear about that. So I think that in, under the circumstances and looking again, again at the geopolitical location, they've done, a, you know, what they could do. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you think Turkey um, is handling the whole situation that is surrounding it, like you said? Do you think they're doing quite well not to get too drawn in, but doing enough they to... Have, they're in an incredibly difficult spot, because, you know, you have the whole... You have you have Kurds and you have also Kurds in uh, P PKK, Kurds who are not very friendly to the, to the Turkish regime in Turkey. You have, um, you, have, you have the Syrian side. It's very, very complex for them. And they're handling it as well as they can. It's mm -hmm. not an easy spot to be in. And, you know, it's, it's not easy if you have... They're, they're very worried about having ISIL next to them. But how much can they do? We should also see that the current prime minister is the foreign, former, form, former foreign minister who had this doctrine that Turkey wants to get along with all of its neighbors. And that went well until the whole Syria thing started to explode or implode. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I guess yeah. it's easy for European powers, America, etc., that are further away from where Turkey is to be sort of mouthing off and grandstanding and yeah. saying, you should do this, you should do that. When you're yeah. actually right there in amongst it, you have to think a bit more, a bit more sort of tactfully, yeah. don't you, about your, your location and about your immediate situation. Exactly. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm advising the Istanbul Finance Summit, which is sort of the big economic summit once, uh, which happens once a year. And it, it, you know, it is, and so, so I'm pretty close to the whole Turkish, um, you know, situation. It's really, really um, thin ice they're walking on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Melanie, just explain uh, why they've they've done this. Why is this Ottoman tomb so important to Turkey? Because it goes a long way back, and it's for it a very, a very long big significance. Way back, it? Yeah. exactly. It is the tomb of the grandfather of the founder of the Ottoman Empire. So this is um, from Suleiman Shah. So they. Uh, you know, it also, um, also the tomb is also, it, it, uh, it holds his remains. 
as well. And so I think that, again, under the circumstances, given the sacredness of the, the mm -hmm. contents and, and given where they are, both politically and economically, I, I, they, they could have done nothing else. Doesn't get much bigger no, than that. It doesn't yes. get well, much let's move on to, um, to a, a Singapore paper, The Straits Times, and uh, this says Australia to embark on major security review. This is um, after, obviously, um, recent events in Australia, the Sydney siege, and uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott has said that a review will go into that, um, uh, uh, the, the, the siege in December, and he's also apologised and said that he's, uh, the, the security um, forces in Australia let the uh, country down. Just, uh, it's a very difficult position though, isn't he, Cornelia, in terms of uh, if you go too far, if you, um, you know, go into people's privacy, um, it's, it's stuck between a rock and a hard place, but he was saying that, you know, there were 18 calls made to the police about these guys in the weeks and months leading up to this attack. Could could they have done more, the Australian security forces? You know, that's always hindsight is always 2020, and it's very hard. And you know, we in the Western world, we believe in these civil liberties, but not all of the Western countries fight this. I mean, you see, you have 140 people who are sympathizers and 90 Australians who are fighting with ISIL. You have 550 um, uh, Germans. You have 400 French, and both of them have 180 returnees. So it's really difficult to see how do you act with this. We have these three schoolgirls in the UK that went against, without their parents knowing, into Turkey and now are probably already in Syria. And we're all outraged. How much can you monitor? Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. And what, what worries me is when Abbott comes out and says, oh, when they come back, we strip them of, of nationality. When you talk to our former, the UK former Minister for National Security, um, Admiral Lloyd West, um, he'll say the last thing you want to do is to strip them of the... Of the of the nationality, you want to actually get them in, re-educate them, and get the intelligence out of them. So, so the, the the gut reaction of well, then you you don't want to be here, you don't belong to us, is actually not what will keep you safe in the long run. Yeah, do you think it's um, Melanie that it's uh, people who are say leaving the UK or, or maybe they're, they're Australian and they've become disillusioned. Do you think it's their own personal situation back home that's really the one that we need to try and focus on? We need to be more inclusive in society to make people um, feel like that they have a role in society as opposed to uh, them going on Twitter or going on social media and, and being influenced by um, places in the in the you know Syria and Iraq and, and, and getting ideas of that going over there would better suit them. Do you think it's much more a situation of trying to include them in society here? I think that, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to look at a more multi-pronged attack. It's not necessarily um, around the exposure to social media or the information, because, of course, information is flowing both ways, and so you'll find that people on the other side are probably saying, well, you know what, you know, these women, these Oscar women who are wearing absolutely no clothes, you know, it's influencing, <laughs> it's influencing in terms of in both ways, right? So I think that it is a multi-pronged, um, multi-pronged approach in terms of of the, I guess, curtailing of civil, of, of individual liberties versus, you know, national security. And to look at one solution, Unfortunately, you're right. Hindsight is 2020, and 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 we are forced to review what happened. How did you know? How did someone who essentially was going to act against the Australian state was able to get citizenship? You know, how are you know we're putting other people? How are we putting all of these people in danger? But I, 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 I've. If I knew a solution, then I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the one thing, if you ask me what keeps me up at night, the one thing that keeps me up at night, we've seen such a pronounced um, multitude now of, of hate crimes or expressions of hate. You see it against, you know, people are guiding synagogues against Jewish people. But you also see a very strong anti-Islamic feeling. And, you know, we need to understand, ISIS has actually nothing to do sort of misconfiguring sure. Islam. They're using it to their ends. It's nothing to do with Islam, but it is so bad for our Muslim minorities in, in, in Europe and in the U.S., and I think we, we all have to be really working hard at not marginalizing. We have five, on average, about 5 percent Muslims, and the German, the former German president, um, Wolf, said very rightly, look, Juda Judaism and Christianity have always been part of Germany. 
but now Islam is always also part of Germany with you know all the immigrants we have and I think that's a message that holds true for all of the Western world. Yeah, absolutely and you, you have sort of maybe a, a Christian or a Catholic who goes and shoots some people they're not known as being extreme Christians or extreme exactly, Catholics but exactly. it's not the same with, uh, with the Islamic faith yeah correct well let's move on to our third paper which is uh, an Australian paper and this is a similar, a similar story really um, <laughs> what are they up to the headline here in the Daily Telegraph and this is um, talking about an unprecedented threat of terrorist attack and uh, saying that um, there are thousands of extremists living among us it says so a similar kind of thing and I guess um, again just kind of trying to work out where you draw the line between monitoring your people and and trying to stop an attack and, and crossing over into into denying them their freedoms and their privacy you know I am I'm, I'm quite surprised that even the the nature of these articles and, and and Australia's response I think that we have to be very clear that they received 18 calls 18 alerts about Monas for us to start doing this spread gun kind of um, you know machine gun attack um, in terms of the curtailing of individual liberties based on an 18 you know 18 calls about this man then you know I think it, it, we, we're not looking at the proper source because quite frankly we received the alerts but we didn't do anything so now if we're going into curtailing individual liberties then we should have a very very good reason and quite frankly 18 un, kind of un, 18 calls that weren't responded to is not a good enough reason to curtail individual liberties of everyone who may resemble him yeah. I mean, and we're going we're going back to the same exactly. we're going back to the same thing. I mean, we cannot sort of go go that broad. But the problem here is also the law enforcement agencies sometimes not cooperating. We saw that with 9/11. You know, the FBI had something which they didn't pass on to whoever. Um, and 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 here also. And I think we need to certainly we need to look at how we monitor. But we need to not go against who we are. We are about you know being. A free society and we need to make sure that our law enforcement agencies cooperate better with each other so it's it's not just about curtailing liberties it's also about making sure that the people who keep us safe talk to one another yeah absolutely um, well let's um, go to a slightly lighter story in the Shanghai Daily it is obviously um, Chinese New Year um, and uh, the Chinese um, like to give and receive things called Hongbao, which is uh, red envelopes filled with money, um, and they do it every Chinese New Year, and the um, children give presents to parents and vice versa, and Hongbao is uh, very, very popular. And this um, paper on the Shanghai Daily, Gifts Updated for Digital Age, the headline, and this is... Um, the, the, uh, their equivalent of basically WhatsApp called WeChat, and they can send basically gifts of Hongbao over um, over mobile phones, um, and often it's in figures of eight because eight's their lucky number, so eight, 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 and um, often small little gifts and things. But um, I guess you know the, the Chinese are at the forefront of technology these days, and um, and so that's that's to be expected. And you know, uh, so be it. I mean. The, have you guys got involved in Chinese New Year much? Do you? Yeah, I've, I, I used to live in Asia for 13 years before I sort of, you know, I started my career in Asia. But what I think is very interesting here is it's, it's when it's, it was self-evident that something like this would happen, that you would digitize this, the, the, the Hongbao's. But what I think is interesting is how other, um, other e-commerce um, platforms like Alibaba are now trying, uh, starting to capitalize on it and say, oh, yes, you can use this with us. So I think this is, this is going to be a whole um, secondary New Year's economy. The, the year of the sheep is going to be the starting point of a whole digital New Year's e-commerce trend. What they're very good at, they seem to be, is a, a, a platform like WeChat, uh, which is just a messaging service. They, they're learning to make money out of it, basically make it corporate, make it a bit of business, it's sort of, you know, a few ideas um, around that. And yeah, they're taking sort of a cultural thing like Hongbao, which is just a present from one person to another, and a couple exactly. of companies cashing in on it. Exactly. And, you know, it, it just reminds us not only kind of the move to online and the move to digitization and online payments, but it's also reminding us that how huge the Chinese economy really is. So if we're looking at one billion red envelopes being delivered over on WeChat, and then that's 639 million U.S. just for Chinese New Year. So, um, and then last year they were saying that there were 649 million users. Yeah. That's absolutely brilliant, you know, just to be able to use the Internet. It's a huge economy that sometimes I find we're at risk at, of almost ignoring here in, uh, the, you know, U.S. and U.K.
Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? And it's uh, it's such an important festival as well. And the whole of the exactly. country pretty much closes down it's, for about two weeks. Exactly. Everyone's exactly. It's, it's fireworks beautiful. in the streets. If you think it's that the biggest migration event it's in the world, beautiful. it's even bigger than the Hajj, which yeah. is very interesting. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. It is amazing. And also, um, you know, you think that um, sort of uh, New Year here with all the fireworks that happens at midnight. Those fireworks happen throughout the day yeah. for two weeks in the middle of the street. Just everyone going it's bonkers. And they're trying to, yeah. I think they're trying to scare away soot, the evil spirits. Yeah. Guys, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Great so place much. to you and thanks a lot for coming. Thank in. you very much.